Over well, recent videos, we've talked about a lot of things around employment during the coronavirus situation. And we've also mentioned how we're going to come out of this and the need for planning. The need for planning what the workforce is going to look like, the need for planning the skills, the need for planning how we're going to structure our employment practices in the future. We've talked about all of these things and we've looked to remain as positive as we possibly can on this. However, we also have to face a prospect of people being made redundant in the post coronavirus economic climate. We will be coming out of this and we will be striving to prosper in the future. The immediate situation is going to be about how we make our organisations and our companies so that they are agile enough, so that they are flexible enough to be able to take advantage of the next phase of the economic situation in the UK. Now these videos are largely directed at the smaller employers, charities or private sector. And they're also directed to some extent at the people that are employed within this enormous sector of our economy. And if we want to make this economy thrive in the future, we have to be in a situation where we are not all going under. We have to make sure that we have the right workforce prepared for the, any advantages that we can take, any opportunities that we can take to build our businesses again. So I need to talk about redundancies and I need to talk about the need for preparation and planning for that. And through good preparation and good planning, we can get through this better. We can look to how we can actually reduce the redundancies that we may be envisaging at the moment. And we can reduce that through engaging our workforces through consultations. Talking about consultations, we look first to the legal framework of that. We look to the Trade Union and Labour Relations Act, and we look at the obligation within that to uh, collective consultations. Should the employer be looking at putting at risk of redundancy 20 or more employees? 20 to 99 employees at risk means that the employer is required to enter into a minimum of 30 days consultation with either the trade union or with elected representatives if you do not have trade union representation in your organization your company 100 or more and you're looking at 45 days minimum consultation less than 20 and you're not obligated to collective consultation, but I would recommend it, enthusiastically, I would recommend it because it's good practice and it demonstrates integrity as an employer on your part. It's important that people are given as many opportunities to participate in any redundancy process as possible. The more they're engaged, the better the ideas that can be developed in avoiding redundancy and consultation is about how to avoid redundancy and in that you can look at all sorts of things reduced hours uh, temporary layoffs uh, shared work some people going half time other people working less than a full week voluntary redundancies perhaps early retirement there are all sorts of ways that you can look at avoiding redundancy and the more you engage with your staff the more you will be able to find those ways forward in your planning you need to take a number of steps you need to look at preparing things like selection criteria who is going to be at risk why are they at risk are there things that can be done to avoid it what can you do to make it that your selection criteria is fair? When we talk about legislation, you are also impacted upon by things like the Equality Act. You have to be mindful about equality implications when looking at 
your redundancy proposals and your selection criteria. Making it that your selection criteria is as objective as possible. Now, in my book, Human Resource Management Made Easy, I cover this sort of process, looking at how you can prepare selection criteria that is as fair as possible, and it will help you avoid making unfair selection for redundancy, and that will help keep you out of the employment tribunal. But I'm talking to people I hope and believe to be ethical and, and are of principle, that values drive the employers that I hope to be talking to through these videos and through my book. So when you're getting prepared for these things, the more you're engaged with your employees, the better. The more you're engaged and the more information you provide, the better. So when you're providing inf information, you are obliged to provide certain information like why you are considering redundancy, who is under consideration for redundancy, what roles are under consideration for redundancy. You're obliged to provide that sort of information and more. But I can tell you that from both the employer side of this and from a trade union side where I've negotiated redundancy with employees from a trade union side when I was much, much younger, the more information to hand, the more constructive those consultations can be. And as I've said before, the more authentic you are as an employer, and that will stand you in good stead, not least of all in the employment tribunals, should it come to that, but also for future, as you are coming out of the, out of the, uh, recession that is likely to follow this situation as you're coming out of that people will want to come to you as an employer to go to employer you need to prepare in terms of scheduling all sorts of things like the consultations the meetings individual meetings because regardless of whether you are entering into collective consultations you need to go into individual consultations and you need to be able to schedule those meetings and people need to be informed of what they're going to be talking about at those consultation meetings. You need to schedule if worst comes to the worst and you need to eventually start making people redundant. You need to schedule the dismissal meetings and you need to have all your letters prepared. So when you're looking at your selection criteria and you're looking at going into the consultations and you're looking at all the meetings, it is better that you have some template letters ready to go on those things so that you know that you are gonna be fair and you're gonna be consistent throughout of these, these consultations right up to the point of those dismissals being made. You need to be prepared for what your organization looks like at the end of this. You need to be prepared for having the right skills and the right knowledge with the right people that are going to remain in your employ. You need to have all that ready for when you come out of this. Because if you come out of this with just a smaller workforce than you had before, the chances of you doing well are not going to be good. Because if you, if you don't have the improved skills, you're less likely to have the resilience to thrive in what is going to be the new normality. Throughout all of this, I said it at the beginning and I'm going to say it again. You need to be aware that you are dealing with human beings. They are sensitive to these things. Having been through the redundancy process from the receiving end more than once, I know how debilitating it can be. I know how difficult it can be. I know the grief process. I know the feeling of uselessness that, uh, that someone has. So the more an employer can put in to support an employees that are going through this process, throughout the process, the better. And by that, I mean all sorts of support like helping with CB writing, all sorts of support like uh, helping with letter writing and interview skills, so that people can come out of this prepared to go for employment elsewhere. Giving people the time to do that, making sure that you have put as much support as possible into helping people through this stand to you again in good stead as an employer, both now and in the future. 
So I think it's important that you're aware of those things. I think it's important that you are also aware of things like the notice periods that are required in this and the redundancy payments that are required. When you're looking at the notice periods, if someone has worked for you for less than two years, then they're entitled to one week statutory notice. It's not much, but it's something. If someone has worked for you for two years plus, then they're entitled to one week's notice per full year of employment with you. Now, full year means exactly that. If it's one week short of a full year, it's not a full year. And so notice periods or payment in lieu of notice are one week per full year up to 12 weeks notice or payment in lieu of notice. Redundancy pay. Under 22, they're entitled to half a week's payment, redundancy payment per year of employment under the age of 22. From the age of 22 to 40, they're entitled to one week's pay per week, per year employment. One week's redundancy per year of employment. From the age of 40 plus, age of 41 plus, they're entitled to one and a half weeks pay. One and a half weeks redundancy pay per week of employment. So that goes up to a maximum of 20 years. And all severance pay up to £30,000 is tax free. So Let's just recap, quick recap. The sooner you enter into consultations, the more authentic an employer you are, the more extensive the consultations, the more authentic the employer you are, the more you are likely to engage people, the more you are likely to be able to identify ways of avoiding redundancy, and that's what it's all about. But should you be faced with having to make people redundant, you will know and they will know that you've done your level best to make sure that the impact is minimized and that you have done the best that you possibly can. Thank you for watching. Later this week, I'm hoping to do an update on the guidance that has been issued for consultation by the government for the return to work. Okay, thanks you, bye-bye.